Hey guys, welcome back to our series where we are talking about the Book of Enoch. Now, if you are new to the series, please go back to the beginning and start from there. You can find the whole series as a playlist on our channel or you can find it on our website, axinitiative.com. But please go back to there because this is actually my conclusion video. So I've already presented all of my arguments. This is really me just summing up what we can take away from this. So please go back to the beginning and work your way through because this is all very, very important and very beneficial for us to understand. So throughout this series, we've looked at the book of Enoch. We've looked at how it relates to the New Testament. Okay, Jude directly quoted it. Not only did he quote it, but he called it prophecy. And Peter tells us that all prophecy, all true prophecy comes from God and is breathed out by God through the Holy Spirit, which is exactly what Paul says about scripture. It's breathed out by God. So Paul says that scripture is words that are breathed out by God. Peter tells us that prophecy is words that are breathed out by God. And Jude tells us that the book of Enoch is true prophecy. That would mean that the book of Enoch should be considered scripture because the book of Enoch is words breathed out by God. According to Jude, Jesus takes it a step further as we saw when he was talking to the Sadducees who only believed that Genesis to Deuteronomy is scripture, they didn't read anything else. They didn't read the book of Enoch and they were asking him a question. And he said, you guys are wrong because you don't know the scriptures. And then he immediately taught from the book of Enoch to explain what he was saying. So Jesus is saying, you guys are wrong because you don't know the scriptures. This is what Enoch said. This is what you should know. And he's calling the book of Enoch scripture. And we looked at all this in more detail. We also looked at how the apostles referenced and quoted and alluded to and taught from the book of Enoch over and over and over and over and over. They taught about Jesus from the book of Enoch. We looked at how Enoch saw visions of heaven that no man has seen. And he described it in the exact same way that John later came along, saw visions of heaven that no man has seen. And he said he saw the same thing but Enoch was written first. We consider John to be scripture. He actually saw that. Well, if that's true, then Enoch must have seen it too because Enoch was written first and describes the same thing. We've gone through the book of Enoch seeing how important this book was to the early church, how important this book was to the apostles and Jesus. And so this really brings me to a big point that we should take away from this. And to show the importance of this point, I want to read something from the book of Enoch. At the very beginning of the book of Enoch, he says, The words of the blessing of Enoch, with which he blessed the elect and righteous, who will be living in the day of tribulation, when all the wicked and godless are to be removed. And he took up his parable and spoke. Enoch, a righteous man whose eyes were opened by God, saw the vision of the Holy One in the heavens, which the angels showed me. And from them I heard everything, and from them I understood as I saw. But, not for this generation, but for a remote one which is to come. So Enoch is saying, this book that I have written, this is for not the people living at my time, but for people in a coming generation, the people living in the day of tribulation, a remote generation in the distant future, this book is written for them. That's how he opened his book. That is the very first couple of sentences in his book. Towards the end of his book, he said, and now I know this mystery that sinners will alter and pervert the words of righteousness in many ways and will speak wicked words and lie and practice great deceits and write books concerning their words. But 
When they write down truthfully all my words in their languages and do not change or diminish from my words, but write them all down truthfully, all that I first testified concerning them, then I know another mystery that books will be given to the righteous and the wise to become a cause of joy and uprightness and much wisdom. And to them will the books be given, and they will believe in them and rejoice over them. And then will all the righteous who have learnt therefrom all the paths of uprightness be recompensed. So Enoch is not only saying, hey, this book that I'm writing is for a remote generation that is to come, the generation that's living in the day of tribulation. Not only does he say that, but he says, I know that people are going to change the words of righteousness. He says they will alter and pervert the words of righteousness in many ways. So this book that we call scripture, according to the book of Enoch, which we have seen in many ways, this should be regarded as scripture. And according to this book, the Bible that we have has been altered and perverted in many ways. For example, there are things that are supposed to be in here that we don't have. We don't have them with us. And Enoch said that this is what we should expect. The words of righteousness will be altered and perverted. But, then he says, but when they write down truthfully all my words in their languages and do not change or diminish from my words, but write them all down truthfully, all that I first testified concerning them. Let's pause there and recognize the fact that the book of Enoch was lost for almost 2,000 years. The words of righteousness were altered, they were distorted, they were perverted. And the book of Enoch was lost for almost 2,000 years, but then it was found. And now, very, very recently, it's being translated into various languages and given back to the people. This is what Enoch said would happen. And he says... Then, at that point, when his words are translated and given back to people, it says, then I know another mystery, that books will be given to the righteous and the wise to become a cause of joy and uprightness and much wisdom. And to them will the books be given and they will believe in them and rejoice over them. And then will all the righteous who have learnt therefrom all the paths of uprightness be recompensed. What is he talking about? Well, that brings me to my larger point for this series. And that's the fact that if we can look at the book of Enoch and see so clearly that the book of Enoch belongs in scripture because Jude called it prophecy, Jesus called it scripture, the apostles taught from it, all the things we've been going through in this series. If we can recognize that the book of Enoch should be in scripture, then we need to start reevaluating some other books as well. Our whole idea about the canon of scripture is built on man's tradition. Men chose which books belong in here. And when we look at the canon of scripture and anybody asks, how do we know there's not supposed to be anything else in there? The best answer that the best scholars can give is essentially, trust us. They say, God preserves his word. The Bible doesn't tell us that God said nothing will be added or removed. In fact, the book of Revelation said all of these curses that are in this book will be put on those who add or remove. The implication is some people are going to add or remove. This whole idea that people have that God preserves his word is not based on scripture. Scripture does not promise us that God is going to preserve his word in the sense that he will keep the canon of scripture to be perfect and unaltered. I believe God preserves his word in the sense that here we are thousands of years later and we still have it. Yes, it's preserved. But I don't believe that God preserves his word in the sense that men will not try to distort it because the Bible specifically promised us that men will distort it successfully. Furthermore, if God preserves his word in the sense that man will not distort it and the canon of scripture will be accurate, then I ask you a question, who is he doing that for? Because the Protestants have a different canon than the Catholics who have a different canon than the Ethiopians who have a different canon than the Greek Orthodox. So 
Who is God preserving the word for? How do you know that you have the correct book? These are all questions we should be asking because we can look at it very logically and say clearly what men are teaching when they say, we know this is the correct canon of scripture because God preserves his word. And that's their full argument. And that really is the basis of their argument. When we look at that logically, we can just look at that and say, well, that can't be true because that would mean he preserves it for these people, but not those people, which means he didn't do it, which means we have no confidence that we're in the right group. Protestants, you need to recognize the fact that there are a ton of books that you do not have in your Bible that were in the Bible for thousands of years and were only very recently removed. That is a historical fact. Not only were they very recently removed, and not only were they in the Bible for a long time, but they were in the Septuagint. Do you even know this? This is something I didn't know. I had no idea that there were books that were in the Septuagint, they were considered scripture in the Bible at the time of Jesus and the apostles. Okay, the Septuagint was the equivalent of the Bible for the early church. And you know what it included? First Maccabees, second Maccabees, third Maccabees, fourth Maccabees, Tobit, Judith, Wisdom of Solomon, Sirach. There are so many books that quite frankly, when I grew up in the Protestant church, I thought those books were Catholic books. That's what I was always taught. They're not Catholic books. They are ancient Jewish scriptures that were considered scripture at the time of Jesus and were included in the Septuagint. And they're not the only ones. Because like I've said, the canon of scripture was not established until well after Jesus. There was no canon of scripture at the time of Jesus and the apostles. That is a man's tradition that was developed later on. So we should be looking at Jesus and the apostles as a reference point. What did they consider to be scripture? Well, they were clearly teaching from the book of Enoch. So they clearly saw the book of Enoch as scripture. These are the sort of questions we need to be asking ourselves. My point is this, we need to be thinking. We need to be people who think and recognize that we're following men's traditions. There is not a single place in the Bible that tells us which books belong there and which don't. And if you look these things up and you understand where this tradition came from, you'll understand that it came from men. It came from church leaders at a time of apostasy. These people gathered together and they voted and the church was already in very bad shape at that time. And yet those are the people we're trusting to give us the canon of scripture. The Old Testament canon of scripture was literally put together by people who rejected Jesus. This is the history. It is a man's tradition. And we need to move on from men's traditions. Enoch told us, that when his words are given back to us and translated into our languages, then the righteous will receive other books as well. And they will accept them with gladness and they will learn from them and they will gain wisdom. Why? Well, I think it's because when you look at the book of Enoch, once it's in your language and you can read it, you can see for yourself how clearly this book was regarded as scripture by Jesus and the apostles. It's an overwhelming case. And when you recognize that, then you can begin to evaluate these other books as well and recognize that your canon of scripture is a man's tradition. And it's something we should move away from. And when you move away from that tradition, you can then go to these other books and evaluate these other books as well. And you start understanding things like the books of the Maccabees and Judith and Tobit and Wisdom of Solomon and Sirach and many others were included in the Septuagint. They were included in the quote-unquote Bible of the early church. And it's a very recent man's tradition that removed them. And when we begin to understand that and we start reading these books, we begin to see all of the things that we can gain from these books and be taught by these books. The book of Enoch is the key. It's the book that is so clearly supposed to be scripture that is not included in scripture so that when we recognize it, we begin to realize we need to evaluate all these other books as well. 
And then those books are given to us and we can learn from them and we can gain wisdom and understanding from those books as well. Now, I'm not sitting here saying, hey, all of the Apocrypha is scripture. No, I'm not. Especially the New Testament. I really, the New Testament Apocrypha is something that I would highly suggest you be wary of. Okay, the Gospel of Thomas talks about Jesus losing his temper and killing people. Okay, the, the New Testament Apocrypha, I would very much caution you, be careful with that. Because those books were known, even at their time, to be fraudulent. So, I would caution you to be wary with it. Some of it might be legitimate. I haven't honestly looked at the New Testament Apocrypha enough to know. But when it comes to the Old Testament Apocrypha, guys, there are, there are so many references in the New Testament from these other books. You have no idea if you haven't read them. Okay, Maccabees, this is what Jesus was talking about when he says, when you see the abomination of desolation as spoken by the prophet Daniel, and he says, let the reader understand. Why would the reader understand that? Because that was an event that had already occurred and it was written about in the stories of the Maccabees. And if you understand the story of the Maccabees, then you'll understand what the abomination of desolation is. No, it's not a pig sacrificed on the altar. You'll understand what that is if you know that story. And then you can understand what Jesus is referencing and what Jesus is talking about. Then once you know that story, you'll know what to look for. You'll know, okay, Jesus is saying, I should look for this thing that's going to happen. And the reader can understand. That's why it says, let the reader understand. Because you're supposed to know the book of Maccabees. You should know what the abomination of desolation is because you know the book of Maccabees. When we look at the other books that are included in the Old Testament Apocrypha, we see so many ties to the New Testament. Okay, just here are a few examples. In the book known as Second Esdras, which is also sometimes called Fourth Esdras, this is Ezra, it's just the Greek version of his name, but Ezra, who is in the Old Testament. In this book, Ezra said, There is a city built and set in a plain country and full of all good things. But the entrance thereof is narrow and is set in a dangerous place to fall, having a fire on the right hand and on the left a deep water. And there's only one path between them both, even between the fire and the water, so small that there could but one man go there at once. If this city now be given to a man for an inheritance, if the heir pass not the danger before him, how will he receive his inheritance? And I said, It is so, Lord. Then he said to me, even so also is Israel's portion. Does that sound familiar at all? The way is narrow and dangerous and few will find it. What about this verse? This is God speaking to Israel and Judah. He says, I gathered you together as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings. But now what will I do to you? I will cast you out from my presence. When you offer oblations to me, I will turn my face from you. For your solemn feast days, your new moons, and your circumcisions of the flesh have I rejected. I sent to you my servants the prophets whom you have taken and slain and torn their bodies in pieces, whose blood I will require of your hands, says the Lord. The Lord Almighty says, your house is desolate. I will cast you out as the wind does stubble. Here's a quote from the book of Jubilees. Jubilees 1, 23. And after this, they will turn to me in all uprightness and with all their heart and with all their soul. And I shall circumcise the foreskin of their heart and the foreskin of the heart of their seed. And I shall create in them a holy spirit and I shall cleanse them so that they shall not turn away from me from that day unto eternity. And their souls will cleave to me and to all my commandments, and they will fulfill my commandments, and I shall be their father, and they will be my children, and they will all be called children of the living God, and every angel and every spirit will know, yea, they will know that these are my children, and that I am their father in uprightness and righteousness, and that I love them. I hope you know the New Testament well enough to recognize that that is what the New Testament teaches. But Jubilees, another book found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. This predates Jesus. Okay, he says here he's going to circumcise the foreskin of their heart and the foreskin of the heart of their seed and create in them a Holy Spirit. Well, this is something Paul taught regularly. He said 
A person is not a true Jew if he is only a Jew by physical appearance. True circumcision is not only on the outside of the body. A person is a Jew only if he is a Jew inwardly. True circumcision is done in the heart by the Spirit, not by the written law. And then in Colossians, Paul said, In Christ you were also circumcised. But not with a circumcision done by hands, it was a circumcision done by Christ, which cut away the body of flesh. This is exactly what Jubilees said. God will circumcise our hearts and give us the Holy Spirit. In the Testament of Levi, this is from the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs. Okay, and in the Testament of Levi, it describes Levi passing through the first heaven, through the second heaven, and into the third heaven. This is similar to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians when he says, I know a man who is taken into the third heaven and the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. In the life of Adam and Eve, or sometimes called the book of Adam and Eve, it says, 18 days went by. Then Satan was angry and transformed himself into the brightness of angels and went away to the Tigris River to Eve and found her weeping. Well, in 2 Corinthians, Paul says even Satan himself disguises himself as an angel of light. Where does he get that from? That's not in our Old Testament, but it is in the book of Adam and Eve. In the book of the Ascension of Isaiah, it describes Isaiah being sawn in two. And in the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, it talks about the prophets and says some of them were sawn in two. Okay, these are just a few examples. I don't have time to go into all of the books and talk about all of the things. But my point is, the New Testament is drawing from many other books that we do not include in our Old Testament. And we can see that the book of Enoch was clearly scripture to the apostles in Jesus. They taught from it, they referenced it, they called it scripture and prophecy. And so if they're willing to think about a book that we don't include in our Bibles, if they were calling it scripture, then what about all these other books that they were quoting and referencing as well? It's time that we start reevaluating these things. I'm talking specifically about the Old Testament books, okay? They tend to be separated by scholars into two categories, Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha. Don't get thrown off by the different titles. Those are all assigned by the scholars today. Just Keep in mind that these books, these Old Testament books that are not included in our Bibles, they're only not included because men decided to not include them. Specifically men who hated Jesus and hated Christianity. So I want to encourage you guys, start looking into these things. As I've been saying throughout this series, condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance. If you're going to dismiss an idea because it goes against everything you've ever believed and you hold to that so tightly that you won't even hear the arguments going against it, then you don't really know what you're talking about. You don't actually have an argument and you don't really have grounds to stand on. And remember the Bereans, okay? In the book of Acts, Paul came to the Bereans and he taught the gospel of Jesus, which was something they did not yet believe. They didn't know it. They didn't agree with it. And yet it says they were willing to hear him out, hear his arguments, and then they went and searched the scriptures for themselves to see if it was true. And it says because they were willing to do that, many of them were saved. And so as I've said all along throughout the series, that is all I'm asking. Look into these things and stop blindly following man's traditions. So now, just to conclude really quick, I want to point out a few different options for you as you look into these things. The book of Enoch that I've been reading from throughout this series is found in this copy of the Complete Apocrypha, which is actually not complete. But this is, I found this on Amazon. It's put out by Covenant Christian Coalition. It's called the Complete Apocrypha. It includes Enoch, Jasher, and Jubilees. Great books to read. Jasher is a weird one, but great book to read. As always, anything that's put out pretty much by any scholars these days, they include a little introduction where they tell you it's not scripture. I actually cut out a page of introduction because I was like, nope, I don't even want that in there. But at the beginning of each book, they say, this isn't scripture, but it's a, this is what it's about, blah, blah, blah. Skip the introductions, just read the text and evaluate it for yourself. This is a great resource to have. 
Another translation you can read for the book of Enoch is this one here. It's the Hermenia translation by Nicholsberg and Vanderkam. Uh, this is actually the first version that I ever read and uh, it was helpful, but I will admit that it's a little more difficult to read, which is why I primarily am reading from this one and quoting this one, which is also still kind of difficult. It's older English, um, but it works. And then you can also find the Book of Enoch as well as pretty much every Apocrypha Pseudepigrapha book of the Old Testament in these huge books right here. This is the Apocrypha books. These are the Pseudepigrapha books. Again, don't get caught up in the different titles. Those are assigned by scholars today. So don't get caught up in that. But these books here, these are very difficult to read. It's very older English. It was translated, I think, in the early 1900s. Uh, but this includes Jubilees, the Letter of Aristeas, the Books of Adam and Eve, the Martyrdom of Isaiah. That's the other one. Sometimes it's called, I think I said Ascension of Isaiah earlier. Uh, the Martyrdom of Isaiah, First Enoch, Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, Sibylline Oracles, Assumption of Moses, Second Enoch, Second Baruch, Third Baruch, Fourth Ezra, Psalms of Solomon, Fourth Maccabees, Pirke Aboth, the Story of Ahikar, Fragments of a Zadokite work. I mean, okay, I don't even know some of these all that well. I'm not saying everything in these is scripture. I'm just saying I think they're worth looking into and evaluating. Some of those books, honestly, I haven't really read very much. And then the Apocrypha side of it includes 1st Esdras, 1st, 2nd, 3rd Maccabees, Tobit, Judith, Sirach, Wisdom of Solomon, 1st Baruch, Epistle of Jeremiah, Prayer of Manassas, Additions to Daniel, and additions to Esther. Now the additions to Daniel and Esther are very interesting because they are basically extended versions of the books that we already have in our Bibles. And one interesting thing about the additions to the book of Esther is that our version of the book of Esther doesn't even mention God, which is so not right when you understand the Jewish culture. Like they would not have written a whole book and not mention God. But when you get into the additions to the book of Esther, it talks about God all the time. And you see this side of Esther that makes a lot more sense with the story and why God chose her. Because our version that we have, so many Christians read it and it's just like this romantic love story of Esther becomes queen and she lives the dream. And No, Esther in the additions to the book of Esther is saying, God, this is not what I wanted. I was picked. I had no say in the matter. I hate my crown. I hate my glory. And every chance that I have, I don't wear the queen's clothes and I wear the clothes of a peasant and the clothes of your people. And I, I, I identify as one of your people and not as queen of, of Persia. And, and it, it makes it make a whole lot more sense why God chose her because she was someone who feared him and followed him. So anyway, it's really cool. There's so much out there that is worth reading. And then finally, you could also pick up a copy of the complete Dead Sea Scrolls in English and look through that. Now there's a lot of stuff, just because it's Dead Sea Scrolls does not mean it's scripture. There's a lot of stuff that is in here that was part of their community, their community rules and stuff like that. But they have a lot of these ancient scriptural documents as well that were found there, among which included many of the books of the Old Testament that we have, as well as books of Enoch, books of Jubilees, books of the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, and various others. And then you could also pick up a copy of the Septuagint. This is just one of many translations. But if you pick up a good translation that includes all of the books that were in the Septuagint, you will get books of the Maccabees and additions to Esther and Judith and Tobit and the Prayer of Manassas and Wisdom of Solomon and Wisdom of Sirach and the Psalms of Solomon and Baruch and the Letter of Jeremiah and additions to Daniel, additions to Esther. All of those are in the Septuagint as well. So those are worth checking out as well. And then finally, on your phone, you could... Go to, at least on an iPhone, you can go to the App Store and look for Book of Enoch, and there is a version of the Book of Enoch there. You can find it online. Guys, this stuff is available for you to read, but you got to be willing to go out and look for it. If you're just settling on the books that we have in our traditional Bibles, and you're just following man's tradition, you don't even know what you're missing out on. And I can tell you from personal experience that there are things in our New Testament that have become staple verses of Protestant theology where we've built doctrines and theology around what Paul said in this passage in Romans. 
And what people don't even realize is that Paul is actually quoting from an Old Testament Apocrypha book. He's teaching from that book, and that book, in that passage that he's quoting, is teaching a completely different concept, and we're missing Paul's whole point, because we don't know the context of what he's quoting. We don't even know that he's quoting it. And I've found numerous examples of this throughout the New Testament, where people are teaching something wrong from the New Testament because they don't know the scriptures. Just like Jesus said, where people are teaching things from the New Testament without even recognizing or acknowledging that the verse they're reading and quoting was quoting something else and teaching from something else and pointing us back to something else. It was never meant to be something that stands alone. It was meant to say, look guys, I'm referencing this thing. Go read this thing and you'll understand my point. But if we don't read these other books, we're not going to understand the New Testament because the New Testament is quoting and referencing and teaching from so many other books than what we have in our Bibles. And the evidence for it is clear and overwhelming, and there is no good reason to reject those books. The only reason is the traditions of men. So let's stop following them. Let's stop blindly giving them authority and blindly following them. And let's go look into these things for ourselves. Like I said, when I read these Apocrypha books and Pseudepigrapha books, some of them I don't give as much credence to as others. I'm not asking you to go and accept all of them. I'm asking you to look into it. Some of them don't even claim to be scripture. The Letter of Aristeas is more of a historical book. It's a valuable book to read. It's just a letter a guy wrote back in ancient times that had to do with the translation of the Septuagint. It's an interesting book. I don't consider it scripture, but it's a historical document. It's worth reading. Check it out. Don't be so afraid. Let the Holy Spirit teach you. And let's start looking into these things. Because according to the book of Enoch, which we can clearly see is scripture. According to the book of Enoch, when you recognize that the book of Enoch is scripture and you start to read that book, you will begin to see other books and other books will be given to you and you will gain wisdom and understanding from other books. And Enoch was saying there will be a time when there will be total distortion and twisting, but then a time will come when his book is given back to us. And historically, that is exactly what has happened. Not only did Enoch accurately prophesy when Jesus would come, but he accurately prophesied the events that would occur over the 2,000 years that have happened since Jesus. Things that he could only have written accurately if he lived today. Because these things have happened very recently. The book of Enoch has only very recently been given back to us and translated into our language. And yet, thousands of years ago, he said that's precisely what's going to happen. And he said that when you recognize it, and you read it, and you learn from it, you're going to start recognizing and reading and learning from other books as well. And it will be a blessing. So don't turn your back on these books just because men have always told us to. Let's open these books up. Let's read them. Let's learn from them. Let's use our own intellect with the help of the Holy Spirit to evaluate them and see what do we think about this? What do we think about that? Do these things line up with the New Testament? Do these things line up with what we know to be scripture? Or do they not? Were these things quoted by the apostles or were they not? Let's look into these things ourselves and stop just blindly following what people have told us to do. I know that this is a controversial topic. I know that it is a hard thing to accept. And I know that a lot of people won't accept it. But for those of you who are willing to hear, those of you who have ears to hear and eyes to see, Look into these things. You're the people I'm talking to. Check it out because it's really cool and it's really beneficial. And there are a lot of things in the New Testament that a lot of Christians don't understand. And the reason they don't understand it is because they don't know that that thing in the New Testament is teaching from an Old Testament Apocrypha book. They don't know the reference. And so they can't look back at that first book to see what the point of that passage was 
And that's why they don't understand the point of the passage they're reading in the New Testament. And so they wander around in the darkness, completely blind. And what's worse, a lot of them become teachers and then the blind lead the blind. It's time to stop doing all this nonsense. Go check out these books for yourself. Don't be scared of them. Trust that the Holy Spirit can give you wisdom and understanding. Part of the very fabric of the new covenant is that God said that he will teach us directly and we will not need to be taught by another man. So let's trust our teacher and trust that he's going to show us what's real and what's not. Be a Berean and go look into these things for yourself.